this prosperity for now that we're enjoying. We must protect it. What we own here in this, like I said, magnificent valley, other people want. We've been attacked, literally attacked here in Fort McDowell. Not only through gaming, but they literally came after our jugulars through the land. There's been past attempts to, uh, to, to remove us from, from our home here. On May 12, 1992, our bingo hall at that time uh, was being raided by uh, uh, the FBI's and other law enforcement agencies. I noticed that the moving vans that they put all the slot machines in were, had the words Mayflower in huge letters on it. Now how ironic could that be, you know, early ships landing on American, uh, North America invading native lands, if you will, and they've got Mayflower vans, so I thought that was kind of in your face on the part of uh, the U.S. government. Gaming was our 90% of our income, and that's what I wanted to uh, protect our tribal rights our tribal sovereignty to have uh, gaming machines if we wanted them. Because uh, we came to find out that after that, if the state had gaming, then the tribe was entitled to gaming. They threw several of their FBI agents on the roof. Pretty much had their M16s aimed at us. So they backed all the trucks up in the back and uh, basically just start manhandling all, all the machines into their trucks. We got down to the casino, we saw about six people standing there, five which were women. Uh, my mom, Ella Doka, was one of those ladies. And uh, Gilbert Jones uh, was the vice president at the time, he was there. And we got up and asked what was going on and they were explaining to us that they were raiding the casino. The, the women said that they were gonna block the front entrance to not let the trucks get out and at the time it was just them so someone came up with the idea to start contacting the other tribal members on their own not any, not uh, under any direction from the leadership or anything they, they were doing it on their own and uh, like I said this this began to snowball and uh, before we knew it we had an enormous amount of vehicles um, heavy equipment vehicles uh, at that time that the tribe owned and, and they parked it there. So basically it was a showdown. They said, we're not going to move on, until this thing is, is, is pretty much resolved somehow. Within the hour, man, we were, we were pretty much submerged or surrounded by uh, all, all the different media, helicopters flying over and everything. And, and here at Fort McDonald in 92, there was only one way in and one way out. And I'm sitting at my desk doing uh, gubernatorial duties and uh, my uh, deputy chief of staff, Doug Cole, popped into the office and said, Governor, we have a problem. I was looking at uh, Doug with uh, disbelief that, that this was actually going on. We knew nothing about the, uh, about the raid or the activity. It was a bigger issue about whether Indian gaming was legal or not and all that. So um, I decided that uh, it's important that I go out there, even though I had no real authority because it's a federal issue, federal land, but it sounded like Linda Akers, the U.S. attorney, needed a little help and maybe, uh, uh, I think the chief was Clinton Patia. Maybe I could help uh, sort of lessen passions because it sounded like they were, uh, you know, they were close to violence and I didn't want that kind of thing happening on my watch. And him and Clinton had a meeting inside the casino where this cooling off period was negotiated. What that meant for our side was that we would open the roadblock and, and the machines would stay here in the trucks and, and, and the FBI would be allowed to leave. As that cleared out throughout the day, the, the members said, we're gonna guard the trucks. And while guarding the trucks, they said, let's have social dances at night, you know, to pray and just make sure nobody, the state, doesn't come back and take the trucks. Ten days to cool off, and we had ten days of powwow after that. A lot of tribal members from different tribes, New York, uh, 
Oregon, Washington, state of New Mexico, and plus the 21 tribes here in Arizona were represented for the other 10 days. Oklahoma was a lot of people there. I believe there's five other tribes that got raided that, that day, but we were the only tribe that stood up to the, to the FBI and the state. We didn't know what kind of impact that was going to have on anybody. We were just w worried about people coming onto our land and trying to tell us what we needed to do. And when we understood that this land belonged to us, it was our land. I think the whole ordeal lasts about two weeks, thereabouts, about two weeks. The machines did stay here until one day that our leadership and the government had further agreements to let the machines go. And, and the, the announcement was made that the machines would go to a neutral site and, and, and that the machines were going to go to the Salt River of Pima Maricopa Indian Reservation. When the machines left, um, that's not what occurred. They, they took the machines to uh, a warehouse um, somewhere along uh, I-17 and um, I-10, right in that district. But I, I'm going to probably say within two or three weeks after, after all that fiasco happened, uh, Governor Symington and our President Patia signed that gaming compact. And I was, I was heavily criticized for, for uh, doing a compact. There was a great concern that introducing big time gaming in the state would change the nature of our state, change our, our general culture. But the fact of the matter is the state really had no choice because it, the state was sort of being put into a position where it was forced to agree because if the state didn't agree to a compact of some sort that we negotiated directly with the tribes, the Secretary of the Interior at the federal level could come and impose a solution. I, I preferred that the state controlled its destiny rather than have the Secretary of the Interior come in and say, well, you guys didn't get it done, so I'm going to do it and, and this is the way it's going to be. And that gaming compact, as I understand, what was allowed was pretty much uh, what each tribe or reservation, their population. So the more people you had as tribal membership, the more machines you got. So in the end, I think we gained maybe 25 machines, around 375 at that time. So we didn't gain much as, as our own community after going through all that fiasco. But as I understand, that had not that, um, I'm, I'm going to say resistance, and at the other tribes, there was no resistance. Maybe there was, but it wasn't effective. If it was, I don't know. But here, had not Fort McDowell stood up for its rights and, 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 and pretty much stared down the state and federal governments, uh, who knows what would have happened. Maybe Indian gaming as we know it wouldn't exist. We don't know. You know, we just have signed off on our third compact with the state of Arizona. And our reasons of why this business is important to us, it's education. It's government services. Um, it's law enforcement, public safety, uh, housing for the community. And you always hear about jobs, jobs. It's all the above, but in addition, it benefits all of us, not only just our 870 membership tribe, it's thousands and millions of people. And that history still stands with all of us today um, because it really opened the doors for Indian casinos, not only in Arizona, but across United States.